vision cost? Oh, there, when we start talking about 200 people, do you realize it may cost you your seat? Nobody can sit in my seat. I bought this seat. No. Come on, church. Scoot over. Share it. Half cheek it. I don't care. <laughs> share, your, share, share, share the seat. <laughs> Come on. Let's fill this thing up. <laughs> and, and not because we get brownie points. It's because it's about reaching those that don't know Christ. Let's do our part. And so, um, but we've been talking about vision cost. And, and then um, last week I talked about you and I are visionaries. You know, you we're visionaries. Hey, it, it, you know something? You don't, have to, you don't have to do a whole lot of teaching. I, I, I use the illustration of, of little girls dreaming about their wedding day and their knight in shining armor. You don't have to start telling them all these things. There's enough things going on around. And they start thinking, well, when I get married, I want it to be like this, this, and this, and this. I'm going to wear, we're, I'm going to wear uh, green. And, you know, you know, they have all these great ideas, right? They're a visionary. And then when we start talking about church, then we go, well, I don't have any vision. And yet, I'm telling you right now, God has caused you and I to be visionary about the things that he's called us to. And so this morning, I want to take just a few moments and talk about vision failure or success. When I started thinking about vision failure, I thought about this. This is the thought that I had in my mind. Um, and, and I'm sorry for me sharing my thoughts with you because I know that will get you lost somewhere in outer space. Uh, uh, but the point is this, is that Houston, we have a problem. There's failure somewhere along the line here, and there's a problem. But I'm, I'm telling you that God's not called us to have a vision that fails, but he's called us to have a vision that succeeds. And I'm, I'm glad y'all are successful. God's calling us to have a vision that succeeds. Okay. Matthew 26, verse 36. Let me set this up just for a moment. Um, uh, Jesus has just instituted, and I say just within this time frame, has instituted what we identify as the, Lord, uh, the Lord's Supper or communion. Um, then he has discussion with the disciples, and he says, this night many of you will betray, you'll stumble because of me. And then in that, in that context of that, Peter's like, Jesus, I will never stumble. Everybody else may stumble, but I won't. And Jesus looks at him and says, you're going to deny me three times tonight. Not me, Jesus. And so it says this in verse 36, beginning here. It says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which are James and John, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to, said to them, My soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little further, he fell down. He fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he asked Peter, So couldn't you stay awake with me an hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if, it, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they, had, they could not keep their eyes open. After leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the time is near. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. See, my betrayer is near. Father, in these few moments, Lord, captivate our hearts. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand. In your precious name, amen. Um, have you ever planned for something? Maybe it's vacation. Uh, maybe it's a remodel of your home. Maybe, uh, maybe you just planned. Maybe you're a, you're a guy, and this is the way it typically works for us, right? We plan this great we think it's the awesomest date our wife will ever have been on in her life, and she's going to be blown away. She's going to look at us, and the angels are going to begin to sing because of this date. 
And then about two minutes into it, you realize this is going all wrong. You weren't supposed to be mad at me. I said you look nice. You know, and, and all these things. And we plan for it, and it's just like, oops, I said it again. That's where I get in trouble most of the time. Uh, but have you ever planned something just to see it fail? Um, maybe it was because of your lack of your planning. Maybe it was a lack of execution. <laughs> um, maybe it was your lack of knowledge. Um, Tiffany had a coworker say something to her the other day, and she came home and told me what it says. And I got this guy is an idiot. <laughs> um, because you don't ever say that to a lady at all. Not even insinuate that you, you, dude, you're dumb. (laughs) I just don't tell you right now. No wonder you're single. Uh, Anyway, um, but the point is this is, have you ever planned for something just to see it fail? And here's Jesus in this moment. (laughs) And we would look at it and go, man, that was an utter, utter failure. That was a destruction just waiting to happen. For one, he was asking Peter to help us. Right? Mm. We know Peter, don't we? We like to throw rocks at Peter. We like to be upset. And yet, how many times have we been just like him? Oh, maybe we've not stood up and said, I don't know him. But when the Lord asks you to do something, you just kind of shy away. Um, see, as we look at this, I, I, I've got three points and, um, with this. This morning, one is... Um, One of the reasons that we have vision failure is because we fail to accept our assignment. God, Jesus, gave them an assignment and they failed the assignment. Now, don't, all of us have. There's not one of us that's sitting here today saying, oh, I've never done that. (laughs) Uh, Because every one of us sitting here, at some point along the way, if we said yes to Jesus, there's probably been at least some time that we've missed the mark because of our own ignorance or our own uh, lack of knowledge, whatever it might be. But the truth is, is that we have all said, we can't, I don't believe that there's one of us here says, oh, I've never done any of those things. The truth is, is we have failed to fulfill the assignment. Here's the awesome thing. Jesus understood his assignment and he accepted his assignment. Do you get that this morning? He, he understood. At an early age, at 12 years old, we find him. You remember, his parents are looking for him because they left him. And he, they didn't realize that he stayed in Jerusalem. And they said, what are you doing? And he says to them, don't you know that I have to be about my father's business? He wasn't being disrespectful, but he understood his assignment and he had accepted his assignment. You and I need to understand, each of us have an assignment. If we know Christ, we have an assignment. It may be to a particular place. It may be to a particular group of people. But we, we have a failure to accept our assignment and to, to carry it out. And I'm telling you that all of us have an assignment. We could also, we could use the, put the word in vision there. But, but I'm using the word assignment because, see, all of us have a place. All of us have a place in the body. All of us have a, th- a, a, a job to accomplish and to fulfill. And when I say job, don't say, well, I, do this. I always work. No, no, no. I'm saying God has given us an assignment. You know, Mom, if you're here and you go, I don't see any, I don't have any in the assignment. I'm going to tell you right now, if you have sons and daughters, God's given you an assignment. And it's to raise those children to know Him. Thank God for John Wesley's mom. One of the greatest preachers that we know, John Wesley, the beginning beginner, or the one that began the, the Methodist movement. We, we, we began to see a lot of, thank, thank God for people that raise sons, godly sons and daughters. Thank God for the parents of Billy Graham. And, and thank God for all of these individuals that we see that help shape lives. And you go, well, they were, I'm just a mom or I'm just a dad. No, you're not just anything. If it has eternal value, you're more than just. You have an assignment. Some of you have an assignment in your workplace. Some of you have, have assignments in the school that you're going to. That's why I said this morning, and, and I really feel this in my spirit, that we don't need to just say, oh, be nice, be sweet. Go release them. You know where we see some of the greatest opportunities for revival, uh, not only in our nation, in the history of our nation, but even prior to that, came in from young 
people. You want to know why? Because they're fearless. They don't think anything's going to hurt them, right? And they just step out for, for God. David, before Goliath, and Saul says, oh, you're not skilled in this. And he says, hey, listen, listen, king. <laughs> listen, the Lord delivered me from the, from the lion and the bear. He can deliver me from this man. Young boy understood his assignment. And so we, we fail because we fail to accept our assignment. In fact, there's a story uh, of William Booth who for the first 10 years of his marriage, um, he, he was kind of in a quandary of asking what was God calling him to do. Um, one one uh, event took place in which his wife was invited to preach in London while he was there. He took a, a, a late night walk through the slums of London of the London's East End and Every fifth building was a pub. Most had steps at the counter so little children could climb up and order gin. Then that night, he told Catherine, I seem to hear a voice sounding in my ears. Where can I go and find such a heathen as these? And where is there so great a need for, for your labors? Darling, I have found my destiny. And we, because of that call, because of answering his assignment, we have today what we identify as is the Salvation Army. Millions of people have been touched because someone accepted their assignment. Another thing that we, we in looking at this passage, see, we, we, have a, we fail to recognize our need. Why, why, do, why does vision fail? For one, we don't accept the assignment. Two, we fail to recognize our need. Here's, here's Jesus, and he calls Peter, James, and John to go with him to the inner circle, and we see them as kind of his closest three um, throughout his ministry here on earth. And he calls them, and, and he's telling them, I am distressed. I am sorrowful even to the point of death. Pray with me. And yet we see them moments later that they're asleep. See, we fail... Our vision fails in our lives because we, we, lack, we lack understanding that we are people of need. You know, before, in, in the passage before this one that I read, where G, uh, Peter says, I'll never stumble. He was arrogant to think. He was arrogant to think, I, I'm never going to fail Jesus. You know, you and I, in our arrogance, you know how we miss um, misrealizing what, why vision fails for us? Because we're arrogant. I've got this. Um, in fact, as, as we look at this this morning, um, pr- Bob Sorge in his book, Secrets of the Secret Place, he says, prayerlessness is the first sign of prideful independence. Prayerlessness is the first sign of prideful independence. I've got this. Lord, I don't need your help. And the reason we fail in vision is because our lack of, are not recognizing our need. And the third thing I would see this morning is failure to understand the time. Failure to understand the time. Oh, we've got time. We may have time, but they may not have time. We look at it a lot of times based on how we feel about it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't have any problems. Everything's going well, and, and I've got time. But they may not have time. They may walk into a situation that they didn't realize that they were walking into that was going to be a death trap for them. And I'm not saying all oh, doom and gloom or any of those kind of things, but I'm saying, telling you this morning, we need to have a divine urgency about the time that we're sitting in. Here he, here's Jesus, and he calls the disciples to pray. And, and in this most, um, most difficult moment of Jesus' life, as he's crying out to God, is he, do you think he's wanting them to pray so maybe God will change his mind so Jesus is... No, he's asking them to pray for him, that he would have the courage, that he'd have the boldness to walk through this thing. And yet, here they are in the moment in this this situation, and they missed it because of their lack of understanding of of the moment, of the time. Jesus would tell them in, in, in moments before this, he'd say, look into the fields, they're ripe unto harvest. What happens to a, a field, and, and I know most of us in here aren't farmers, and I'm, I don't proclaim to be one, but how many of you know this, that if the field's ripe unto harvest, what happens if it's not harvested? It rots. It's ruined. 
Have you ever heard of a banana that was, you bought it and it was green and you let it sit on your counter for about four days, five days, six, three weeks? <laughs> right? See, Tiffany doesn't know my, see, she always gets, up, why don't y'all let these go bad? See, because my trick is this, because most of the time if they start going bad, she'll go, well, I guess I'm going to just have to make some banana nut bread. <laughs> I'm no dummy. <laughs> I just gave my secret up. But the point is this is if the harvest misses its harvest time, it becomes worthless. And he's saying to us, and he said to them, the harvest is the harvest is ripe unto gathering, ripe unto be harvested. And look, right now, don't say there's four months. Right now is the time. And the reason that we fail vision or vision fails for us is because we fail to recognize the moment that we're in, the time that we're in. We always think we've got time. And here's one of the things um, I, I was talking to a, a young minister the other day, and I'd ask him, have did your kids start school? Yeah, they, they start school and they're in like the third and first grade or something like that. And I said, man, you better enjoy every moment of it. <laughs> it's going to be gone like that. I said, my baby's starting her junior year in college. We had time. And we don't have that time anymore. And we do the same thing when it comes to the harvest. It comes to the same thing when we have vision. We've got time. We don't have to, why, why is pastor so urgent about all this? Why do we have to keep doing all this? It seems like we're, and because there's a, there's a moment that we have. Whether it's our moment or their moment, we don't know. But we better take advantage of every moment that we have. Sadly to say, when we begin to read this passage in, in Matthew 26, really, the, the truth is, is it's a picture of the church. Right? When we should be worshiping, we're fussing. Well, I don't like that song. When we should be working together, well, if they're going to do it like that, I'm not going to do it. When we should be praying, we got so many other things to be going on. It's a picture of the church. Sadly to say, it's a picture of the church. And I, I, I'm saying this this morning. I'm not, I'm not throwing a rock at you. I, 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 if, if I do, it's going to come back to me. The point is, is that, listen, we miss the urgency of the moment, of the time, because we, we miss the assignment. We, we think that we've got this. And then when, when it comes and goes, we're like, man, I wish I would have. You know, many times you, we, when we talk about death or, or we have conversations and talking about people nobody's sitting on their deathbed and said I wish I'd spent more time at the office it's always well I wish I'd have had more time with my family or I wish I'd have done this more and those kind of things and listen don't let us stand before the Lord and say well I wish I'd have taken care I would have taken advantage of the days that you did give me but that's the negative side of it right that's the vision failure because of those things but let me tell you how we have vision success Here's how, we, here's how we have success. Let's take the, the antithesis. Let's take the opposite of those things. To know and accept our, what our assignment is and to see it come to fulfill. How, how, do, we, how do we get to that place? I'll, I'll tell you how we get to that place. We get to those places. It's conceived and birthed in moments of prayer. Oh, come on, somebody. Listen. We're, we're not going to get through this thing. Don't think, well, I, it's too difficult. It is difficult. If Jesus had to pray at the most difficult moments of his life, can I tell you something? That gives us instructions of how we should handle the most difficult moments of our lives. And right now, he's saying, he's saying to us, he's saying to the church, hear the assignment, accept the assignment, but understand this, if you'll come to me and hear from me, I'll make the assignment not only bearable, but I'll make the assignment joyable. Take my yoke upon you, for it is easy and light. And so to know and accept, how, how do we make vision successful? To know and accept what our assignment is, um, we have to have intimate time with God. Um, we need humility. Jesus, or, or the Lord says to Solomon in Second Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray.
Let's not be arrogant and say, well, I'll never stumble. I, I, don't need, I don't need anybody's help. I can do this all on my own. Listen, our arrogance is what will cause us to fail on the vision, on the assignment that he's placed on the inside of us. James writes that God gives grace to the humble. He's gracious. And so we need to know and accept our assignment. But the other thing is we need humility. And then thirdly, I'd say this morning to ask for wisdom to understand the urgency of the moment. Understand the urgency of the moment. There's several things I'll point out in regards to this as I close. Scripture says that even the last days would be shortened so that even the elect would not be deceived. What do what I mean by that? I don't know about you, but man, it seems like, I, I said this last Sunday, in 2019, we're just going to, we're going to celebrate New Year's and Christmas all on the, <laughs> the same time because it doesn't seem like it's happening that fast. I know that has a little bit to do with getting older and some of those pieces and all that. I, I fully understand that. But the point is, is we need to recognize the urgency of the moment. Do you see all the, the catastrophes, the natural cat- catastrophes that are going on around the world, the earthquakes, the hurricanes, all those things? Scripture points to that saying, this is the beginning of the sorrows. This is the beginning of the end. When you begin to see these things, get ready. So church, we need to recognize the urgency of the moment and say, listen, Scripture has said, and you go, well, I don't, I don't know if I believe it. Listen, be, be um, smart on your own like that. But if you'll go and begin to look at it, Scripture and how it was all fulfilled, and if all these other things were fulfilled, and we come to this point right here, and we begin to see all these things, you better take, you better take uh, great thought in regards to rejecting it or accepting it. If all those things, thousands of years came to pass at that moment, can the things in these last few years, and, last, and I say few years, maybe the last, next 300, I don't, we don't know how long it's going to be, but the point is this, if Scripture was accurate to this point, could it also be accurate as we finish up this thing? So let's, let's ask for wisdom to understand the urgency of the moment. And I'm telling you, if we'll do these three things, and in fact, all three of these things will all come in prayer or through prayer or out of prayer. Because what, what did Bob Sorge say? Prayerlessness is the first step or the first sign of prideful independence. When we lack prayer, church... The reason we're doing, the reason we're doing the, the, the prayer mod, modules, module, models is to help you, to help us, to all those things. And it just gives us a format, but it also allows us to corporately to come together and to pray and begin to seek God. Listen, we, we can have 200 people here, but if His presence doesn't come and touch the hearts of men and women and boys and girls, then what we've done, we've gathered a crowd. And that, that by itself is awesome, but that by itself is not the, not the point of it. The point of it is so, so people would know Christ to make Him known. And so you and I, the only way we're going to do that is through prayer. There's no other way. There's no great scheme. There's no better worship team. There's no better preaching. There's no better all those things that we got to throw all together and say, well, then we, we create this, um, this recipe for success. I am telling you right now, all of those things, no matter how great they may or may not be, those things by themselves are just things. They don't make a difference. They don't make an eternal difference. But prayer. In prayer, we accept, we know and accept our assignment. In prayer, we come in humility because my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. In prayer, we ask for wisdom to understand the urgency of the moment. Church, let's not have vision failure. Houston, we have a problem. Heaven, we have a problem. No, let it be the opposite of that. And let there be vision success. Not because of something great that we did, but because of something great that he did in us. Father, I just thank you for this day. Help us to hear with the spiritual ear and see with the spiritual eye. Father, captivate the hearts of men and women in your precious name.
going to take just a few moments and we'll close. One, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I'm going to tell you something. The greatest decision you'll ever make, I didn't say it was going to be easy. I didn't say that everything was going to turn out exactly the way that you thought. I'm just telling you, if you'll say yes to Jesus, if you'll say yes to Jesus, you have someone that's going to come alongside of you and to help you. Not only that, then we have a hope in the future. Not only a hope in the future in, in this life, but a hope in a future for eternity with Christ. So you're here today, you don't know Christ. I, I, I encourage you, I, I invite you to say yes to Jesus. How do we do that? We say, Jesus, be the, forgive me, for I've sinned against you, I've rejected you. Oh, Lord, I've recognized my sin, and I ask, Lord, that you'd forgive me for that sin. And, Lord, would you be the boss of my life? You know, that seems so simple. It is simple, but it's not easy. If you're here today and you've said yes to Jesus, but you're not exactly where you, you know you're not where you're supposed to be, today's the day to repent. There's nothing wrong with repentance. Repentance is an awesome thing. Repentance is merciful and grace, grace toward us. And you're here today and you know you're not living right and you need to repent. Can I, can I encourage you to repent? It's not a bad word. It's not a scary word. It's not, oh, I don't like crying. Well, don't cry. Just ask him to forgive you. The Bible says that if we'll, be, if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So if you're here today, you don't know Christ, or you need, to, you need to get back in alignment with Christ, today's the day to do it. The second thing, and this is a, a, really a charge to all of us as, a, as the Destiny family. Listen, we are calling you over these next six weeks to join us in prayer. I, I would encourage you to be with us on Monday night. There's a dynamic that you can't, you can't captivate by yourself. Monday night prayer at 7 o'clock, and I know it doesn't work for everybody. I'm sorry. Um, if we could do prayer every night, we would do it. It just it doesn't, it doesn't really function that way. But Monday night, 7 o'clock. If you can't be here till 7.30, come at 7.30. If you've got to be here at 7, have to leave at 7, okay, that's fine. Just come. Be a part of that. But anyway, I, I'm encouraging you, challenging you, twisting your arm, what are, compelling you to come as we pray and we're believing for God to help us. Not only just Friends Day. You know, Friends Day is just an event. We're just using that to help us. But that, you know, why can't we have 200 next week? And then on, on Friends Day, let's have 400. Hey, Jesus added to the church 3,000 in one day. Surely, with all the technology, surely, with all the conveniences, surely we could do something better than that, right? You hear me? But the point is, is this, is, is we're, we're believing God to help us, not just so that we can add people, put people in chairs, but so that we can add people to the body of Christ. So as we pray these prayer models, I encourage you to join us. Go online, you can go on, faith, they said Facebook, or go to the website, and, and you can go and you can w- walk through those things. Um, we call it on Monday night, we call it passionate prayer. Because James 5.16 says this, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual, fervent prayer. And so we come together on many nights and have effectual, fervent prayer. So I, I invite you to join us. Father, we realize that in our own ability, we'll fall way short. But we do know this, that you are more than able. Lord, those that are here today and they don't know you, Holy Spirit, convict them. Holy Spirit, draw them to repentance, draw them to salvation. Lord, we just thank you for it right now. In your precious name. Amen. Thank you, God.